Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first public event of this academic year, sponsored by the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics. I'm Marie Griffith, the center director, back from a year on research leave, and it's really nice to see all of your faces uh, here again. I do want to thank Lee Schmidt for serving ably as the acting director last year in my absence. Um, among other contributions, Lee put together a semester-long lecture series in religion, medicine, and the law. And today's lecture is the inaugural event in that series. Some of the most pressing political questions of our time occur at points where religion, medicine, and the law intersect. And so this series will examine a range of important topics in this area with the aim of informing the often heated discussions surrounding them. And we do hope you'll be able to join us for the remaining lectures in this series. Our next speaker in this series will be Wendy Kadge uh, from Brandeis University. She's speaking on religious chaplaincy. And the date for that lecture is October 8th. Uh, same time, same venue, right here. And then we have two more folks coming later in the semester on November 3rd and December 1st. So hopefully you've all seen this information and, and can get that and we'll uh, see if you can join us then. Uh, let me also note that today's lecture will be followed by well, a few minutes of Q&A as we always have that will go till no later than six o'clock. And then we do have a reception today just outside these doors in the foyer there of Umrath Hall. And all of you are very welcome to attend and to meet our speaker and um, me, our other faculty, staff, and fellows who will be present here at today's event. So that reception will go from 6 to 6.30 and then um, we will promptly end at that time. Today's speaker is David Craig, who is Professor of Religious Studies at Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, AKA IUPUI. He holds a BA in Politics from Oberlin College, a Master's in Theological Studies from Harvard Divinity School, and a PhD in Religion from Princeton University. He taught at Villanova before moving to IUPUI in 2000. Uh, and he's received a number of teaching and service awards at IUPUI, including the Trustees Teaching Award in the IU School of Liberal Arts. I should say this is an honor that he has received not once, but twice. He's also received the Academic Advisor of the Year Award in the IU School of Liberal Arts and the Chancellor's Faculty Award for Excellence in Civic Engagement. He has a truly impressive record of being invited to speak about teaching as well as about his own research in a wide uh, range of venues. Professor Craig, in his own research, specializes in economic, environmental, and healthcare ethics. Uh, as he told me just a little while ago, he considers himself to specialize in public ethics. What he does is public ethics, so he'll speak to us more about that. His recent book, Healthcare as a Social Good, Religious Values and American Democracy, is based on interviews with religious hospital administrators and interfaith activists. And it explains and assesses competing ideas of healthcare reform in the national debate. And I just can't resist reading uh, part of one blurb from Lisa Sol Cahill, who's a, an ethicist at Boston College. She says that what is truly remarkable and unique about this book is its expert, detailed, and comprehensive rendering of the economic and political intricacies of US healthcare and the reform debate. This is the kind of invaluable resource to which theologians and social ethicists rarely have access. Healthcare as a social good supplies a superb model for religious engagement with the ethical and practical challenges of healthcare in this country. Professor Craig has also convened a range of community conversations on the role of congregations in providing health and wellness in Indianapolis and other venues, and he is a much sought after expert on the Affordable Care Act and its application in particular state contexts. 
Uh, he's also an expert on churches and health reform in this current political context. Again, it is a very impressive CV of talks and public conversations on matters of great import in our own time. Professor Craig's other publications include John Ruskin and the Ethics of Consumption and a range of articles on religion, ethics, and politics uh, in a lot of different scholarly uh, journals. So Professor Craig's lecture for us today is titled Obamacare and American Values. Please join me in welcoming him now. Thank you very much, Marie, for that nice introduction. <clears throat> and <clears throat> pardon me, thank you all for the warm welcome here today. Um, I'd also like to thank Lee Schmidt for inviting me, <clears throat> excuse me, today. And also thank Sherry Pena for making all the arrangements so smooth. I really appreciate that. Um, it's a delight to be here for the Danforth Center's series on religion, medicine, and law. I'm going to take it in a slightly different order today. I'm going to talk about medicine and health policy first, then I'm going to throw in a little religion, and law is going to show up along the way. So I, I think I'm going to hit all three uh, as we go here. As, as Marie said in her introduction, um, the, the book I wrote is based on research interviews I did at Catholic and Jewish hospital organizations across the country. Um, <clears throat> meeting with people who are trying to live out a stated mission and values. In addition, I also met with activists from a group called the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, which lobbied for the reform law in Massachusetts that became the basis of the Affordable Care Act. So it was a different kind of research for me. I'm used to reading books and sitting in my office, and this got me out talking to people. Uh, one of the things I learned is it's much easier to make a dead person say what you want to say than a live person. Uh, but it's, it's, it's good to talk to live people, I discovered. <laughs> um, I went initially to do this project because I was looking for intelligent, moral discussion of healthcare, <clears throat> which is hard to find, uh, I have to say. And some of my interviewees were looking for intelligent, moral discussion of healthcare too. So I'm going to give you a quote from my very first interview. This was the first interview of 100 interviews, and I have to say it was about the best one I had because he defined the issues so well. <clears throat> Whoops, I went the wrong direction. Here we go. So this is a long quote, but it's from a government affairs director, and what I love about it is it captures a lot of the issues I'm going to try to talk about. <clears throat> so I'm half kiddingly, but half seriously saying that we're going to bring the capitalists and the socialists into a room, and we're going to have a battle royale because it's meaningless for me to go into the, into the public policy arena saying I'm for universal coverage, and that's all I can say. We're going to wake up one of these days, and healthcare reform in the market is going to have to happen. If you don't like the entirely individualistic model, if you think it's going to leave out the poor, you should be concerned about who we are. So now is the time to engage. What are we for? To me, that last line is very important. <clears throat> what are we for? What are we for in healthcare? If they have difficulty inside a Catholic healthcare organization that has a common mission talking about this, right? <clears throat> this is even harder in the public debate. And we're quite free with our labels, of course, in the public debate like capitalist and socialist. So I'm going to show a couple of uh, cartoons, uh, which I consider to be sort of a Rorschach test. So look at these cartoons and check your emotional pulse. Do you see one of them is true and the other one is simply not true? Are they both not true? Are they both true? OK, so here's the first one. Right, so the, the, heading, is compassionate, the, the heading is compassionate conservative. But this is Paul Ryan. Uh, <clears throat> chair of the Budget Committee in the House saying, hear that, America? That's the sound of self-reliance. Beep. Right? So here we have the corporate tool, right, who's profiteering off of privatized Medicare. Right? And then the next one. Right? It says, Democrats' health care reform. And the caption is, we don't consider your father worth saving, but if it's any consolation, we do consider your child worth aborting. So these are both uh, pretty visceral, though maybe one's a little more visceral than, for you than the other. And it's interesting to notice that both of them basically say the other side doesn't care about life. The other side is so heartless that we shouldn't listen to any of its values. 
I want to try to step back and say, I think it's important to have a conversation about American values. And you may not really accept the idea that there is such a thing as American values, but I'm going to try to persuade you that there are some shared values in healthcare today. <clears throat> okay, so one place that I think is helpful to begin thinking about the healthcare reform debate today is to notice that there actually are three characteristic ways of talking about healthcare. And this is what I call the moral languages of healthcare. Some people say that, that healthcare is a private benefit. And this is the first language of American healthcare because of our employer sponsored health insurance system, which is unique in the world. Nobody else has employers so involved in employees' health care as we do in the United States. But we have this idea that, you know, I deserve my contracted benefits. I work, my university gives me benefits, I deserve them. And we in fact feel so strongly about this that we even think, I paid for my Medicare, and those are my private benefits too. Of course they're not. This is one of the problems that we have is people have this idea that this is mine, it's private so much that we forget that it's a shared benefit. And we have a big problem on our hands in our healthcare system because we are not paying attention to all that we share with each other in healthcare. And I'm going to come back to that point. <clears throat> the second language of healthcare is the current conservative language, which is that healthcare is a private choice. Uh, people should make their own choices about what health policies they want. My employer shouldn't make decisions for me. I should choose. And I should pay for most of my healthcare services with a high deductible. We do this with food, we do this with housing. Why not do it with healthcare, right? Individuals should be empowered to contract for the services that they want, and let's turn it into a free marketplace. The third language of healthcare is that healthcare is a public right. And this is the longstanding liberal argument that in fact, human dignity and being able to participate in society obligates a government to ensure that everybody has basic health coverage. Okay, so these are the three languages of healthcare that we find in the debate today. And what I want to suggest is that none of them fits how we've organized healthcare. Healthcare is not simply a private benefit, it's certainly not just a private choice, and it's definitely not a public right. Healthcare is a social good. Healthcare is a social good that we share and pay for together. So this is the argument that I'm going to put forward here. And, uh, the way I look at the healthcare reform debate today is there's a choice before us. The private benefit system is not going to continue in the same way that it has. So we really have to choose, are we gonna make healthcare more of a social good, which is what the Affordable Care Act does, or are we gonna jump over to this private market system, which is what conservatives are proposing to do today? And these are the, really the two politically viable paths ahead. <clears throat> okay, before deciding where we wanna go, we should ask, where, did, where have we come from, okay? And so I'm gonna suggest that there are two key aspects of the social good of healthcare. One of these is that we spend a lot of public money on healthcare. In fact, about half of the money spent on healthcare in this country is paid for by the government. People don't necessarily appreciate this fact. $1.3 trillion in 2013. The other aspect of our social good is that we have a hybrid system public payer, a lot of nonprofit organizations involved in providing health care, as well as private organizations too. So we have this crazy hybrid <clears throat> of public, nonprofit, and private in our system here. Now, to think about where we came from, I'm actually going to use a balloon, <clears throat> okay? And uh, public funding of the healthcare system really started in the 1940s, and it started with research. The government wasn't putting that much into research, but <clears throat> It started investing in research in the 1940s. So that by 1950, about half, I'm sorry, about 40% of research <clears throat> dollars came from the federal government. And today that number is about 40 billion, or about 40%. So private uh, companies put some money in too. But we also put in public health money. Wow, okay, so this is part of the way we've built up the social good of healthcare. Medical training is another way we built up the social good of healthcare. Medical school costs a lot of money. Maybe some of you students out there are thinking about medical school. 2009, $3 billion in fees and costs. But the government actually subsidized it six to one. $18 billion invested in medical schools and residency programs. So we gotta give another puff to the balloon, right? <clears throat> okay, 
Uh, how else has the system grown over time? Public and private insurance. Medicare and Medicaid both came online in about 1965. And Medicare in particular, it's now understood, raised the cost of healthcare about 25% simply by being added. And the reason for this is hospitals knew they had a guaranteed income flow and they started investing in technology. That's a lot. Now that technology just didn't, didn't just serve the elderly, it served a lot of people, okay? But we have to recognize that this was a kind of investment in the social good of healthcare. All right. Well. Public, I mean, sorry, private insurance, that has no public subsidy whatsoever, right? That's just us contributing our money or our employers contributing money. Well, actually, uh, there's the employer-sponsored tax deduction, which is worth $260 billion now. Wow, that's a lot of government investment in my health care and maybe some of your health coverage out there, too. Okay, so the balloon's getting pretty big. Can we fit any more in it? Yes, we can. <laughs> the healthcare safety net. This is the last part of the balloon that I'm going to talk about here. So uh, the federal government also subsidizes, and so do state governments, the safety net because not everybody has coverage, right? And some hospitals have to do a disproportionate amount of indigent care, and so the government compensates them for that somewhat. And then there are federally qualified health centers, which are community health centers that are open to anybody on a sliding scale and are also subsidized. Wow. Okay. So here we have the social good of healthcare that has blown, been blown up through public investment and nonprofit efforts, too. Okay. So what have we gotten for all of this investment? I would suggest we've gotten these values. We've gotten innovation in research. We've gotten excellence in medical training. We've gotten equity for the elderly through Medicare and for the non-working poor through Medicaid because traditionally only non-working people are eligible for Medicaid because it's a welfare program. And then some compassion, and I'm not gonna ex exaggerate it, some compassion for people who are uninsured, who can present to the emergency room or federally qualified health centers or various other backdoor ways into the healthcare system. So I'm gonna suggest that this is what we've gotten so far. <clears throat> and that in fact, not only have we gotten these values, but they've become part of the cultural fabric of how we think about healthcare in this society. And just to give an illustration of that, when there's talk about cutting, uh, you know, negotiating with drug companies to control costs, there's a big pushback that, no, this is going to stymie research innovation, right? Or you can't cut Medicare because this will be breaking our commitments to the elderly. I think this isn't just interest group politics, so that's a good bit of it, I admit. There also are these public values that people are appealing to in making these kinds of arguments. Okay, so this is what I'm suggesting is that we've built a social good of healthcare in the United States. Now to say that it is a social good is not to say it's necessarily good for us. <laughs> That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting we share and pay for it, but that doesn't mean it's good for society in the way that it's currently configured. Uh, the sharing of costs and benefits is incomplete, it's unfair, and it's extremely expensive too. Uh, so here's a quote I got from somebody in my interviews. He was saying, you know, healthcare costs are gonna come down because insurers and the government are gonna lower reimbursements. And this is just gonna happen. We're, we're spending about 18% of our GDP on healthcare right now, which is about 6% 16, 6 more of GDP than any other country in the world today. So he said, our economy has passed through the dot-com bubble and the housing bubble. Next up is the healthcare bubble. We are headed into an era of shrinking reimbursement. The air has to be let out of the balloon, but how will it come out? The Affordable Care Act buys time to let air out of the, air out of the balloon more slowly. So this is what he's suggesting is gonna happen under the Affordable Care Act. Right, and you've probably been hearing some of that screeching, right? Because it is a system that has some creaks and groans to it, right? It's not a perfect healthcare reform law. Okay, but what is the alternative? Uh, what's going to happen to all of these shared funding streams that we've built into healthcare if we move to a personal choice system? If people are making their own decisions about what they're going to pay for, maybe they won't choose to pay for these other things that we've invested collectively. So this is what I'm going to suggest is where we are today. 
we have a we have a social good of health care, uh, but we don't recognize it as Americans. Nevertheless, the Affordable Care Act actually builds on this structure. So I'm going to suggest some ways that the Affordable Care Act builds on this idea that we already share and pay for health care together. Okay, so, um, oops, I went the wrong direction. The ethics of the Affordable Care Act. Maybe you thought those words couldn't go together on a single, on a single phrase, on a single line, but uh, nevertheless, there they are. <clears throat> so one of the ideas behind health care as being a social good is that we pool resources together. We pool resources through public funding and we pool resources through private insurance, okay? And I'm gonna suggest that by pooling resources, individual care is better for most everybody than it would be if you were paying your own way. So this is one of the reasons why it's a social good because we have to support a vast infrastructure of healthcare through pooled funding. Now, this has been done somewhat inequitably, however. So uh, public supports for coverage. I'm subsidized in my health coverage by the government, which is, I think, just great because my employer doesn't have to pay taxes on the portion of my compensation that goes to my health premiums. And somebody who had, doesn't have health insurance, what kind of a subsidy do they get? None. Well, that's fair. The new marketplace exchanges make subsidies available to people who haven't had subsidies before because they didn't have coverage. <laughs> So this is simply a kind of making up for lost time and giving what is due to people in a subsidized system of health insurance marketplaces. Uh, broader shared responsibility for paying into the healthcare system. People do have not very good access, but backdoor access in times of crisis. And the idea here is if we're paying for these instances, we should have a broader responsibility to pay in both the individual mandate that people obtain health insurance, but also the business mandate that businesses who don't provide insurance have to pay something into the system. So both of these are designed to create a little bit more shared responsibility in paying the costs of care, okay, but also subsidizing people who need the care. Okay, so this is part of the social good of health care, shared pooled funds. A second part is there's a social lottery of health need. Some health needs are more predictable than others, but I can walk out of here tonight and be hit by a car. I can be diagnosed tomorrow with a terrible cancer, and I couldn't pay for these things on my own. So there is a social lottery of health need that I think motivates us to say, hey, we've got to figure out how to make sure coverage is available to people uh, and the fact that our past system denied sick, sick people coverage is just unjust. So there are insurance reforms, like you can't deny people for pre-existing conditions and various other uh, changes to how health insurance works. I'm not going to enumerate all of these, but I'm happy to talk more fully about them. The last component of this is uh, there are social priorities like wellness and cost-effective care that would really be good for all of us because it would bring costs down while also improving people's care. We have not done a good job of investing in wellness and prevention in this country, and we've got to figure out ways to begin to do that much more effectively. The Affordable Care Act provides a few tools in this direction, but this is a weak link in the Affordable Care Act. I'll just say that right up front. Okay, so what I've tried to lay out before you uh, so far is this idea that Obamacare actually fits the values that people have invested in healthcare. Now this may be very surprising because we hear a lot of complaining that this is un-American. Right, but I'm going to suggest that just as the balloon showed, we've invested certain things in healthcare. Well, the Affordable Care Act actually largely builds on the structures that are in place and tries to rationalize them by making them more equitable, more inclusive, and hopefully a little bit more efficient. Right, so these are some of the things that the Affordable Care Act, I think, promises. But clearly, there's a lot of pushback against the Affordable Care Act. Why? All right, I'm going to suggest at least two sources of the pushback and try to suggest some of the religious roots 
of that pushback. So now we're moving from health policy, okay, <laughs> toward religion a little bit more directly, though I won't get there quite, quite yet. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm going to suggest that there are two cultural ethics out there that frustrate efforts to reform the healthcare system, at least the way the Affordable Care Act is trying to do. One of these is the ethic of personal liberty and personal responsibility. There's a very strong ethic of personal liberty and personal responsibility in the United States, and this is one of the key sources of pushback against the Affordable Care Act. Another source of it that I'm gonna suggest is we have an ethic of emergency care. We will invest heavily in emergencies, but don't talk to us about regular care. Okay, so these are two of the, two of the cultural ethics that I think are very much in play here. So getting back to the personal liberty, uh, personal responsibility ethic. The Tea Party movement is emblematic of this ethic. Right? And it actually emerged in 2009 in response to the early proposals that became the Affordable Care Act. <clears throat> okay? uh, and perhaps you all remember the great phrase, keep your government hands off my Medicare. Okay, keep your, keep your government hands off my Medicare. Well, this is, I'm gonna put it in the most positive light possible, right? One of the things that we emphasize is people deserve right? Support if they've worked and contributed. Now the other side of it is in people who don't have coverage don't deserve it because they didn't contribute and they didn't work. Well this is factually untrue. In fact, the, among people who are uninsured in the, in the United States, 70% of them live in families with a full-time worker. 70% of Americans who are uninsured before the Affordable Care Act lived in families with a full-time worker. So it's simply not the case that uh, work earns benefits, and it hasn't been the case for a while in the United States too. <clears throat> okay. The other problem with this is uh, the current expected payout on Medicare taxes is four to one. This is a staggering figure. People oftentimes think I invested my money in Medicare and I'm gonna get it back, but actually average payout is four to one right now. It's gonna drop off for those of you who are in younger generations, just know, so it's gonna get down to only like 2.5 to one, but that's still uh, an unsustainable balance, okay? Uh, so market reformers, conservatives actually say both of these are an issue, <clears throat> right? Uh, Employer-sponsored insurance is part of the problem, and Medicare entitlement is the part of the problem too, so let's just give money to people directly and let them make their own choices. Let's give them the liberty to take responsibility for themselves. And so you really get this ethic of personal liberty and responsibility from this kind of libertarian, tea party, market reformer approach. <clears throat> but you also get it, certain religious sources of it too. And I'm gonna suggest one religious source of it uh, which is a certain conservative Christian ethics of healthcare, which emphasizes the idea that we need to protect life and our primary obligations revolve around family and congregation. Okay, so this is an important ethic that we find among conservative Christians, which is the idea that there are two primary spheres of moral obligation, the family and the congregation. In the family, you take care of your own, and in congregations, you provide charity or mercy to others, okay? So here's some excerpts from the Southern Baptist Convention, which was issued in 1994, but then was reissued again when the Affordable Care Act was being debated, but I'm just gonna cite the 1994 version of it. And it says, God is actively concerned <clears throat> and involved in all of life. So you have this life ethic, right? You need to protect uh, fetuses, and you need to protect the elderly, and you need to protect anyone who's in jeopardy of having his or her life, right to life threatened. In addition, the, the, the statement says there is an obligation to provide affordable care for all those in need, which may actually come as a surprise given some of the resistance to healthcare reform, but it's definitely there in the statement and it is a strong feeling too. And one of the ways that the Southern Baptist Convention proposes doing this is by running charitable hospitals, religious hospitals, 
and religious clinics, right? And then the last thing it says is, but we must honor our Baptist heritage of limited government. So again, you get this idea that the family has its obligations to care for its own, and religious hospitals have an obligation to provide charity, and the government should support these two spheres. And you know what? The government provides an employer-sponsored insurance deduction for the family, and it provides tax exemption for religious hospitals. So in fact, the government has been playing out this very vision of how we should think about healthcare responsibility. And the fact that it's compelling for a lot of Americans should not be that surprising to us, okay? But it is a point of resistance to the Affordable Care Act because the Affordable Care Act says we need to move beyond these limited spheres of obligation to broader spheres of obligation, okay? Another source of, of opposition to the Affordable Care Act, or at least resistance to some of the things the Affordable Care Act is trying to do, I think has more power across the political aisle. And this is uh, the idea that there is this emergency ethic of acute crisis medicine in our society. Um, when I talk to people about, uh, so how do moral obligations attach to healthcare? I hear two things. One is abortion and euthanasia. And on the other side, we're saving lives. Healthcare is about saving lives. Sometimes, not always. But this is oftentimes trotted out as the justification for a new treatment or something new that's being done. Now this is a powerful ideal and an important one too, obviously. I'm not trying to, to, to say it isn't. It is also reinforced by certain Jewish and Christian appeals. Uh, a central ethical norm in Judaism is this term pekua nefesh, which means to save a life. And the phrase that goes with it is, you shall not stand idly by your neighbor's blood. This is a vivid image, right, of saving people at death's door in crisis. On the Christian side, the Good Samaritan is the model of this kind of rescue medicine that we all have to engage in. And this is something from the United Church of Christ statement about healthcare reform, which says, the familiar story of the Good Samaritan makes a direct case for universal access to healthcare. We are reminded to love our neighbor, stop and touch the pain, then assist in a caring manner to nurture the neighbor back to health and wholeness. And then the statement goes on to say, and that's why we need a universal healthcare system. Now what's interesting to me about that is this, is this very personal, up close, nurturing your neighbor back that turns into, we need a universal healthcare system. In other words, the government should make sure that it's doing this job for us. What I think happens in the contemporary debate between people who support a right to life and people who support a universal right to health care is they both have really strong, passionate concerns that are, in effect, drowning each other out. So people who are really concerned about the right to life see the expansion of health coverage to people as potentially being so expensive that we're going to stop caring for people who are vulnerable. Partly because, on the liberal side, we really haven't come up with cost-cutting proposals. So if you're going to establish a right to health care, how are you going to contain the costs? Nobody's really answered this question in a way that I think is politically viable, because I don't see a single-payer system as politically viable in the United States today. So what I think happens in the national debate is there are three rights competing and two of them kind of cancel each other out. The first one is the universal right to life for the elderly, the disabled, and the unborn. And I've stated it the way that right to life people would, would state that right, okay? Another right is the universal right to decent health care for everyone living in the United States. And this is sort of the standard way that liberals would frame a right to universal health care. Well, these two sides are so worried, <laughs> right, that they're gonna cancel each other out that the one right that's left standing is this libertarian right, which is the right to personal property rights for covered and purchased healthcare services. In other words, if I have health coverage, I have a right to it, and if you don't have health coverage, you don't have a right to it. And I think that this sort of back and forth fighting between uh, liberals and conservatives about which of these universal rights is more important is really getting in the way of moving forward, which is why I try to counsel 
people on my side of the debate, liberals, to stop using rights language. I think it's better to talk about a social good. We pay for this, we share it together, and we've got to figure out ways to include everybody and do it in a way that's more cost effective and more efficient and all the rest of it. So let me suggest how these two ethics of personal responsibility and liberty and then this emergency ethics flow together in a really important law that we have here in the United States. So here I'm getting to some law. The Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act of 1986, EMTALA, familiar to you perhaps, established the provision that any hospital with an emergency room must stabilize people who present in an emergent condition and then they can transport them to another facility at their own cost if they so choose. This has basically become a, an established practice in the United States that most anyone who presents in an emergency room will be treated. The care will not be perfect care. It will be extremely expensive care. You will be billed for it. You may go bankrupt over it. <laughs> this is not a good system, but there is a back door that's been established by law in the United States. And I think it's a combination of this personal liberty ethic. If you have health coverage, great. And if you don't, well, that's too bad. And then this emergency ethic. But if you're in an emergency, we're going to cover you. This is a terrible way to structure a health care system. It's very expensive. It provides discontinuous care. And it causes people a lot of grief. And we've got to figure out a way to back out of this arrangement that we've gotten here today. But this was central to the Supreme Court debate, the Supreme Court oral arguments about the Affordable Care Act. And I'm just going to give you a brief quote from that debate. So these are the oral arguments before the Supreme Court over the Affordable Care Act back in 2012. And there's a really interesting exchange that I think says a lot about our current political moment. Um, Donald Verrilli, the Solicitor General of the United States, was saying, we have to recognize <clears throat> that the emergency law allows people some access into the healthcare system. And this is what he said. He said, <clears throat> you're going into the healthcare market without, without the ability to pay, but you're getting healthcare service anyway as a result of societal norms to which we've obligated ourselves so that people can get healthcare. And Antonin Scalia responded, well, don't obligate yourself to that. To me, this is the question of the day. Are we going to hold to societal norms which say we are going to provide basic access and maybe even better than basic access to everybody? Or are we simply going to say, you know what? Personal liberty, personal responsibility. If you don't have coverage, you just don't have access. This is a very important moral question today. And I think the answer has to be we have to find ways to include people. And that, in fact, most Americans will not shut the door on people who are seeking care. I could be wrong about that. I do not have quantitative evidence to support it. But I will suggest to you that there are enculturated values which have been built up over time that say we are going to provide a way into the healthcare system so that everybody has at least some kind of access. If that's the case, we got to figure out how to make sure we're paying for health care and sharing health care together in ways that make more sense. Okay. Um, so let me talk about a few more. Uh, let me talk, turn a little bit more directly to my interviews <clears throat> and talk about some examples of how religion and religious values already are and I think can shape uh, the debate, not just the debate, but the implementation of health care reform as we move forward. One of the interesting things that I found in these interviews, talking to people who work in healthcare organizations and ministers, they have these shared values, compassion, reverence, justice, stewardship, excellence, okay? Uh, and they've inherited these core values and they meet regularly to talk about how are we gonna implement all of these values? And some of these values conflict. What's interesting about these conversations is these people are pragmatists, not absolutists. They're trying to figure out ways to make their values work. <clears throat> and, and they're not absolutists about it. But more importantly, they're trying to figure out ways to make their values concrete. 
Sometimes we bring these arguments to the healthcare reform debate without actually saying, but how can we make this work? And these people are really trying to make these values work and give them a kind of institutional shape and force in their organizations. So here are some of my favorite quotes uh, from the study, and I'll, I'll talk about them in turn. The first one was a Catholic priest who was a mission director at a big Catholic hospital system, and he had this mixed metaphor, which I love. He said, I don't know if this fabric of social teaching can fit the whole new ball game of healthcare, <laughs> which requires a lot of capital to compete for patients. Right, so you've got this lovely fabric, right, <laughs> trying to contain a baseball game or, or <laughs> right, uh, duking it out. Uh, what, what's interesting to me about this quote is, is partly these, these tensions between ethics and economics are live every single day in these hospital organizations. How are you going to balance community accountability with market efficiency? Because you have to do both at least in the system we've got. It's a competitive healthcare market, and he's absolutely right. If you're not investing capital, you're not gonna have patience. And if you don't have patience, you can't do charity care. But he's beginning to ask the question, has it become so expensive that we can't even do our mission anymore? One of the sources of that competition in the 90s and early 2000s was something called physician-owned specialty hospitals where physicians went out on their own and created competing hospitals, especially in cardiac, surgery, and other high expense areas. The Affordable Care Act basically ends this practice, at least in terms of letting it expand because the Affordable Care Act does not provide Medicare coverage to new specialty hospitals owned by physicians or to those that expand. I think this is a good move that the Affordable Care Act makes. Most people aren't aware of it, it's sort of one of these provisions that's buried in the law, but hopefully it will begin to minimize some of the, the need to invest so much capital and so much redundant capital in our healthcare system. So this might be a kind of positive step in the direction this priest was looking for. The next one uh, is a concept I heard, which is the Jewish concept of tzedakah. Uh, so tzedakah means justice or is closely related to the concept of justice in Judaism and it is obligatory financial assistance to the poor. That's probably the best way to think about it. And this was a president of a Jewish hospital which is in an inner city and he said one of our problems is we're an inner city hospital and our other hospitals in our area they move out to the suburbs and they leave us with their uninsured patients and they went out to the suburbs to have a better bottom line, well, what does that do to us, right? So this is what, he, he said something, he said, you know, when inner city hospitals move out to the suburbs after paying patients, they have a covenantal obligation of tzedakah for the patients left behind. Now, he didn't really have a good idea for how to do that. He had some ideas, but he didn't think his suburban competitors were necessarily going to give him financial assistance in the name of the Jewish concept that he was upholding. <laughs> um, but, but, but nevertheless, uh, some changes have happened that maybe will make this a little bit less of a concern. So one of the interesting ideas about the covenant and the covenant of healthcare in Judaism is the idea that different groups have different obligations. So doctors and nurses have obligations to provide excellent care, right? And the community has obligations to fund care, especially for people who are poor who can't pay their own way. And individuals have responsibilities to take care of themselves. So there's this really clear covenantal delineation of the different responsibilities people have. One of the people I interviewed was a government relations director at the same Jewish hospital, and she said, we also have to include the government in this covenant. This is what we have to do today. And she was talking about pressure to have more uncompensated care. And she said, hey, we'd love it if all hospitals gave as much uncompensated care as we do. Uh, but the, the answer to uh, people not having insurance is not charity care. Charity care is a 19th century concept. The answer to the uninsured is to insure people. 
So she was really pushing back against this idea that some hospitals should be doing so much charity care because the government should make it more available that people would be covered. Well, the Affordable Care Act is actually doing some of this, especially in states that expanded Medicaid. I know Missouri has not expanded Medicaid, which means that Missouri is really still trapped in one of these situations where poorer patients, oftentimes at inner city facilities, are still showing up and presenting without insurance, whereas that has abated some in other, in other, in other states around the country. <clears throat> the last uh, concept I'll just mention here, or the last quote I'll just talk about, is this one that I got from a nun. Uh, uh, she was a nun who started off by saying, you know, Catholic healthcare is so paternalistic. And then she says, no it's not, it's maternalistic which I loved when she said this, <laughs> and then she continued, she said, we've got to get away from this maternal image that we can do it all. But we can facilitate a heck of a lot of stakeholder solidarity in healthy communities. What she meant by this is hospitals today have an obligation to get care out of the hospital. Now that may sound paradoxical, but hospital care is expensive care, and hospital care comes late in the game after catastrophe has already struck. It's part of our emergency ethics to think that the hospital is the center of everything. And in fact, we've created a system where the hospital is the center of everything. But how can hospitals get care out of their walls? What can they do in their communities to support community care and support healthy communities and partner with other organizations so that, they never, so that people never present in the hospital? There's a big financial problem that hospitals don't get paid for this. <laughs> but this is where our healthcare system needs to move increasingly. And we've actually seen some of this in Catholic healthcare. So I'm going to give you another example of law here. Uh, there's an there's a, a expectation in the United States that nonprofit hospitals have to provide what are called community benefits. Okay, so if I'm a nonprofit hospital, in order to keep my tax exemption, I have to benefit my community somehow. This was implemented in 1969. Why? Because Medicare and Medicaid were gonna take care of poor people and elderly people, right? So we need to do something different. Well, that didn't happen, of course. And there's been a battle since 1969 over what community benefits looks like, especially the question of how much charity care do you have to give, <clears throat> okay? Well, Catholic Health Association came out with community benefit guidelines, which try to balance uncompensated care for people who are uncovered with doing things in their communities, building healthy communities. And actually, their approach, in effect, became law because the IRS adopted the Catholic Health Association's community benefits guidelines for its new form, 990 Schedule H. Now, this is a lot to take in, I realize, but I'm just going to highlight the key point, which is, oh, I see, I can use this. Community benefits, this form says, is primarily about financial assistance and means tested, in, in means-tested government programs, uncompensated care, and Medicaid shortfalls. <clears throat> so the idea is, this is what uncompensated care really is, this is what community benefits really is, and these other things that hospitals have been doing, health fairs, screenings, which are kind of marketing devices, are not really community benefits, and we should stop treating them as so important. But interestingly, even though it's not community benefits, the form includes community building activities. It says, we want to know, hospitals, if you're improving housing in your area. We want to know if you're engaged in economic development. We want to know if you're engaged in community support, environmental improvements, coalition building. Well, I think this is a very positive development. Again, it doesn't have the force of law because it's not actually community benefits, but it looks like the government is trying to encourage this movement of care outside of the hospital, I think in some very important ways. And I'm hopeful that there can be more of this movement toward community health centers and community provided care as a way to connect people, especially people who have new Medicaid, with the healthcare system in a more regular, preventive way that would be more beneficial to them in the long run, and that arguably will actually lower costs across the system in general too. I'm gonna do one last, uh, throw one last item at you. I know I've thrown a lot your direction, but hopefully some of this will stick and people will have some questions or objections or, or what have you. 
One of the groups I spoke to <clears throat> is a group called the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization, which is a remarkable interfaith coalition of Christian, Jewish, and Muslim groups. They were instrumental in lobbying for the Massachusetts healthcare reform law, but also making sure it was implemented in a way that would be affordable uh, and available with quality care to as many people as possible. One of the interesting things that the Greater Boston Interfaith Organization did is they used a local radio station blog to post um, what I call health policy sermons periodically. So the Reverend Herman Hamilton, who was the leader of this group, would post these health sermons which began with a biblical passage and then talked about some aspect of the health care law. And he would do this periodically on important events like when the health care reform law was first passed and then the anniversary of that or when the individual mandate that people have insurance came on board the first time. I'm going to show you one contribution he made uh, commemorate, commemorating the anniversary when the oversight board of this law was trying to decide how much people could afford in terms of health care at different income levels. This is a little bit complicated, I realize, but they had something called an affordability schedule, which said if you make $60,000 a year, this is how much you can afford for health coverage. And if you, and if, and if you don't have that, you know, if, if, and, if, and if your coverage costs more than that, well, then you don't have to have health coverage. That was the basic idea of the affordability schedule. So Herman Hamilton started off with this passage because the board was going to meet on Valentine's Day. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other, which is a perfect uh, passage for Valentine's Day, of course. <laughs> and he went on to say, I hope the oversight board remembers that a year ago when we set the original schedule, we agreed that we were going to try to do it in a way that really helped people. And then he started to unpack the significance of the biblical passage. <laughs> and he said, truth, truth, the value of truth demands that we understand the necessity for an affordability schedule which holds individuals responsible for ensuring their health, and we do. Mercy, however, urges that the schedule shifts slightly only to accommodate the recent change in the federal poverty level. What he's doing here is he's saying, we recognize the truth that people do have to take care of their own health care and their own health. And we accepted the individual mandate even though we didn't like it as a compromise. But that means mercy suggests that we need to make sure that people who face the individual mandate are not having to pay too much money to buy insurance for themselves. This is a major issue that's facing Americans in the United States today. People who don't have subsidies on the health insurance exchanges are struggling to pay for their care and their coverage. The Affordable Care Act doesn't affect me one bit. I don't make enough money for me to pay higher taxes. I'm not asked to pay any more in premiums because of the Affordable Care Act. Maybe I need to contribute something to ensure that other people have the mercy they deserve. In addition to that though, Truth and mercy can play out inside of congregations, which are relatively safe spaces where we can begin to talk about the truth of we got to figure out how to be healthy together. Wellness walks, uh, cooking classes, uh, these sorts of things, chronic disease support groups are more likely to happen in a congregational space of truth telling with jokes and mercy and support. And if we can begin to partner congregations working with community health centers, I think we have a remarkable set of opportunities available to us that I think Scott Morris will be pr probably talking about a lot more when he is your third speaker in this series. So I'm gonna leave it at that. I know I've given you a big, broad brushstroke about health policy, religion, and law, but what I'm trying to suggest today is that contrary to a lot of the political rhetoric, the Affordable Care Act actually builds on structures that we have put in place over many decades to support shared values in our healthcare system. And it actually tries to make it more equitable, more inclusive, and more efficient. It is not a perfect law, but I think it is a step in the direction of recognizing that healthcare only works if we are all in it together. 
We have a my healthcare system attitude today. My doctor, my fees, my coverage. What's it gonna take to get to an our healthcare system? I think this is the cultural challenge and the cultural change that we hopefully all can be involved in to try to figure out how to make healthcare work better in this, in this country. I'll stop there. Thank <clears throat> you.